already in the season of Easter, and here we are again celebrating the resurrection. You think we'd never get over that? And that is exactly the point of our gathering again and again in the season of the resurrection celebration, so that we make sure we never get over that. In fact, our our scripture this morning and our conversation around that will be like Jesus doing the same thing. He keeps coming back to make sure that the people around him understand this is the truth. We're not kidding about this. This is the truth. And finally, and finally, the doubter says, my Lord, my God. Amen? Say, I understand that it's only 67 degrees in here, right? Uh, and, and I hope that's warm enough for everybody. But I want to tell you something. If any time you feel like, you know, it's not warm enough, and you need to get up and kind of swing your arms a little bit to warm up, that is perfectly okay. It's perfectly okay. Yeah, Bobby is doing that. Amen? Amen. Let us worship this morning in spirit and in the truth and the reality resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is risen indeed. Our liturgist for this morning is Peggy Green. She will share with us now the announcements of the day. Which there are a little more than a few. <laughs> On April the 19th at 7 p.m., the Music and Worship Committee will be meeting. On April 21st, 7 p.m., SPRC will be meeting. On April 28th, the Council will be meeting. And I wanted to proudly announce that all of you who came up here and put the sandwiches together and filled the bags with all other sort of goodies made 194 of them. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and they also, we also filled 62 bags of rice to get to the Salem United Methodist Church. Um, the children's home, we wanted to gather up some new games and have boxes of snacks to take to the home. And we'd like for you to bring them, if you haven't brought them already, Please bring them next Sunday for their delivery to the children's home. Again, mark that on your calendar. Next Sunday, bring games and snacks for the children's home. And now Michelle would like to have a few words. I've been asked to tell you all about our blessing bags and their little snacks and items um, that are in here to give to, if you see a homeless person that is asking for donations. And I'm sure if you put a dollar or two along with the, what's in the bag, that would be greatly appreciated. You can pick these up in the fellowship hall as you leave. So if you want to take one or two with you to keep in your car, so when you drive past someone who needs a little treat, um, please be, feel free to go right ahead and pick them up. They've been provided for by, I believe, Peggy and others have assembled them for us. So if you, but if you can't make through the fellowship hall, you can make your own goodie bag to keep in your car. Just take a gallon sized um, Ziploc bag, fill it with some snacks, put in a dollar or two, and keep it in your car. And then when you see someone who needs a little pick me up or a lift, then go right ahead and hand it to them. Thank you. What a nice idea. You have almost hate to give money because you don't know how it will be spent. But to be able to give them something that, that would be a nourishing of uh, value is a wonderful thing. So I don't know who thought of that, but thank you very much. We also want to give special greetings to all who are joining us at, on our recorded worship service. Uh, you know, it really is a joy to share exper this experience with you whenever you may be tuning in. 
We would love to hear from you. Please make any comments, questions on the sermon, prayer requests, whatever. And email them to us at trinitycadencefilpastor at gmail.com. This is the time when we substitute hugs with, uh, with other greetings. Peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. This is our time for call to worship. All around us, springtime changes are bursting forth. 
filling our world with bright greens and yellows. Praise be to God for the continuing cycle of winter and spring, of living and dying and living again. Our lives are filled with the hope of new awakenings and new possibilities in Christ. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. our time of confession and forgiveness. We are compelled by the beauty of the scenes of the risen Jesus, forgiving Peter, overcoming the doubts of Thomas, to present ourselves to the Lord, our shortcomings, failures, and all to be washed in the goodness of his mercy and his love. Please join me in solemn prayer. Join me in our prayer of confession. Good and gracious God, we confess that all the beautiful signs of spring and renewal are revealed by you. We must expose to you our failures to bring fresh beauty into many parts of our lives. When we fall to grow in faith, because we do not give ourselves over to the nurture of your love, let the sunshine of your goodness enliven us to move forward in your Help us to take the risk as love directs us to open our lives to the fresh breeze of your Holy Spirit and come alive to all that is good and right and fair for ourselves and for all. this day, I'd like to take a few moments to give thanks and make dedication for memorial gifts that have been given to the church. People are making gifts to the church all the time. And in a way, we can take time every Sunday to give thanks for those gifts. Every gift is a memorial lifted to God, thanks to the Lord. I'm going to take a moment today to just give some gifts that 
have been present in our church for some time, but now we have the plaques that will be posted to um, memorialize those gifts in the sight of us all. And so let us take some time to do that. You know, one of the most important places in our building is our social hall. It's probably a second to the sanctuary, but it's a place where we do our doings, yeah? It's a place where yesterday we made all those sandwiches and so forth. Uh, it's a place where when the season is right for it, we will have our gatherings. Two gifts have been given to the church that greatly enhance that uh, place for us. One of those is the uh, curtains that hang on the stage, replacing those that have gotten old and tattered with the bright new ones that you've seen there. And the other gift are those chairs. Anybody who has ever set up the social hall has labored under the weight of the old chairs. Amen? Amen. Uh, and, and, uh, and we therefore rejoice with the lightness and the brightness of the new chairs that were given. So I would not like to ask the givers of those gifts if they would come forward. Um, Gloria Kosick, uh, Larry Rockenball. Did I not see Larry come in? There he is. What are you doing way up there, Larry? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Lee, if you would please come forward.
so that they can be seen in our many thanks and love to you, you, and you, for the gifts that you have made. Let us show our thanks. that he has bestowed on all of us uh, and for all that have helped in the mission outreach projects that we have been doing and that we will continue to do uh, in the Lord's name. We celebrate that after her hard work, Christine looks forward to her first interview, so we hope that um, she is able to be successful if this is the right one for her. And we certainly do um, celebrate with her. We also want to celebrate with Gladys. Because tomorrow, mm. Gladys is going to be 95 years old. So happy birthday. I just have cold chills. <laughs> We are so blessed in this congregation. This is not the first time that we have celebrated someone uh, celebrating a birthday in their 90s. And as you know, once a year, we always celebrate those people because they are our elders and they have done so much for this work over the years that we have been in this place. Um, we have a couple of concerns. Susan Schifflitz's sister-in-law, Leslie Hedricks, passed away. And we certainly offer our sympathy prayers to Susan and to her family and the Hedricks family in that. We also offer prayers of strength for uh, Megan Regan. Megan is the daughter of Leslie who passed. And this is the first time that she has had to ever make arrangements for the funeral, for a funeral. And besides that, she's making the arrangements for her mother. So we certainly want to have uh, sympathy, prayers, and strength for her as she has to do that. We also want to keep Carolyn Jenkinson in our prayers. 
Carolyn on Wednesday is going to have a thyroid biopsy. So we certainly do hope that the procedure goes well and that she's able to get the diagnosis that she needs. Is there anyone else who would like to share prayers and concerns? Thank you, Lord, for walking through 
walking with Christine through her education and into these opening of employment opportunities that we pray you continue to be with her and lead her. We pray for all our students, all those who are students in these days of not easy education processes and with the teachers and aides that would supply the thoughts and the leadership of that education that your spirit may lead and guide and help those parents who are working in the midst of it all be Lord. Be Lord our wisdom, be Lord our strength. We ask you to be with uh, Paula and others who have suffered loss. And we ask that uh, you might be with them, bind up uh, broken hearts, and give strength where that is needed. Be with the families of those who have to make the arrangements now and, and lead them, strengthen them, and know that what they do is an honor, what they do is a memorial, and what they do is a, 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 an act of love. And, and be, Lord, the loving presence that accompanies and guides them. Ah, Lord, be with uh, Gladys and others in these days who uh, celebrate birthdays to say once again, life is good. Life is wonderful. Life is beautiful. It's a gift. And we cherish and honor it with every birthday and indeed with every day. And we look to you, Lord. We pray that you would show us again and again and again how we can best honor life in our days. Lead us out of the cycles of violence that continue to haunt us and that creep into all too many places in lives and families. We would ask that you would provide the wisdom, that you would provide the knowledge that you would show us the way to guide us forward. Thank you. In your kingdom, oh Lord, we know that love reigns. In the kingdom of your love, all lives are precious. Every life has a future which needs to be respected and guarded. And we pray that your goodness may fall upon us all. Lead us, Lord, according to your will. And we ask it in Jesus' name and say as he taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were in one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, they laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Jesus. 
And we're going to dwell on two of them this morning. One of them is when Jesus first appears to his disciples um, in a room where the doors were locked, symbolizing the spiritual presence of Jesus, but him showing himself and his wounds to them, showing the very real presence of Jesus in the physical sense. On that first appearance, on that first day, we are going to ask our district superintendent, the Reverend Wanda Duckett, if she would preach a short sermon, probably about three minutes, uh, on that day. And with, well not yet, but with Christine's help, uh, we have a recorded sermon from Dr. Duckett. And following that, we'll talk about the second time Jesus comes. A week later, we don't know where he went for that week, but a week later he comes back again on a Sunday in order to talk to his disciples, this time focusing on the most doubting, suspicious, unbelieving of them all, apparently, and that was Thomas. And we will have a slightly longer sermon from me on that occurrence to try to bring it together the best I can. But let us hear from Dr. Duckett as she helps us appreciate what Jesus does in that first. Oh, and you will see the sign of this. Um, and sometimes looking at that sign helps us understand the words. Where is your peace? A reading from John 20, 19 to 21. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. You know, I love how this text tells the story of how the disciples moved from a mindset of fear to a posture of peace. We could use a little bit of that these days, couldn't we? How did they do that? Where did they find that kind of peace? Well, I believe the text suggests that the disciples found peace in the wounds of Jesus. Because the wounds are evidence that death does not have the final say. The wounds are proof that what happened at Calvary was real. Those were real nails. That was real blood. Jesus was in real agony, and Jesus died a real death. And yet, Jesus offers the disciples the wounds as an invitation to move from deep fear to deeper faith. The mere sight of the wounds provides them the peace that passes understanding because the wounds are a tangible testimony that the peace that Jesus gives is literally death-defying peace. It is pandemic-independent peace. It is circumstance-steady peace. It is unrest-resistant peace. The disciples got excited when they saw the wounds because the wounds are an affirmation of the Old Testament text that foretells that Jesus would be wounded for our transgressions, and by his stripes, we would be healed. Jesus invites us to find peace even in our pain and to allow even hardship to be a pathway to peace. The disciples also found peace in the presence of God. The word says that they were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Where have you seen Jesus lately? Maybe at the bedside of a friend, maybe in the eyes of a child, maybe when you looked in the mirror this morning and took a moment to reflect on just how blessed you are. Oh, my friends, allow the very presence of Jesus, even in ordinary people and ordinary things, to be a source of peace for you, even in these extraordinary times. Look for Jesus around you and be overjoyed, overcome, and overwhelmed by God's peace. For through it all, God is with us, and there is peace in the presence of Jesus. And then finally, Jesus invites us and the disciples to find peace in the mission. So often we don't have peace because we're too consumed with ourselves and with our stuff. Hard times have a way of drawing us inward when peace is often found beyond self, participating in the transformation of the world. Jesus says, peace be with you, not once but twice, not so that the disciples would continue to sit in fear, but so that they would go in mission. 
So take the peace of God into your mission field, into your workplace, into your dinner table spaces, to the world, wherever God sends. For Jeremiah declares that in the peace we offer, we will find a peace of our own. And as we move from misery to mission, we watch our anxiety and our fears dissipate. As our focus shifts from our problems to our purpose, we watch peace take hold. So if you're looking for your peace, maybe it's in serving, maybe it's in giving, and sharing a word of encouragement with someone else. Maybe that's where we find that peace of God that passes all understanding and guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Dr. Duckett helps us to enter into that experience, does she not? She reminds us that there are these great things that Christ brings from his resurrection. His wounds, the wounds of Christ that let us know of the reality of life beyond death and, 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 and of hope in the midst of uh, sorrow and suffering. The uh, presence of Christ that brings peace into our lives and we look for that every day. She mentioned the mission of Christ as Jesus tells his disciples, as I have been sent, so I send you. And we know how he was sent and what that meant to him in perfect obedience. Perfect obedience. And he sends us in the same kind of way. I would very humbly add one other thing to Dr. Duckett's sermon. Don't tell her I did this, but I would add a fourth element, and that is when Jesus breathed on his disciples. It's the breath of life that Jesus brings. It's the same breath that God breathed in Genesis 2-7 when it says, and God formed from the dust the first being and breathed into his creation the breath of life and human life began, right? So what Jesus does with his breath is to breathe new life into his disciples based on the reality and the truth of his resurrection. Breathing into them a new identity, a new life. We move now to Thomas and I thank uh, Jeremiah for this picture. Jeremiah is kind of like our own Local Grandma Moses, amen? <laughs> Knows how to take a scene and portray it in a particular way. Now, what's the notice of the thing? What's the most prominent image in this is that wall, is it not? Jeremiah very carefully made sure that all those blocks come together. A very secure wall. Yet through it comes the presence of Jesus. Symbolizing not just kind of like a miracle, the miracle of the day, that he could do that, but letting us know there is nothing that can keep the presence of Jesus from coming to us. Physical walls and ideological barriers and, in Thomas's case, even the confused and bewildered and suspicious thinking of human beings like also, us. Also, if you look to the sides, there's actually columns. There's actually what? There's actually pillars on the sides. Pillars on the sides. Yeah. So the oh, okay. Pillars. Now, you can imagine which of these figures is Jesus, right? Jesus is the guy so, in the middle, and Thomas is the guy with the face. Yeah. The guy with, look at this. Yeah. Doubtful looking guy. Huh? The clouded expression. Symbolizing who? Us! <laughs> in our suspicion of all things. Oh, that can't be. Do you remember when uh, a person first landed on the moon? And do you remember after that, there were people that said, oh, it's just staged, you know? And they said, well, you know, they can do those uh, wax commercials where the wall gets, where the floor gets miraculously clean, and we know that's not true. Well, they can do the same thing with on the moon. We're a suspicious people. We're suspicious even to this day. And Thomas symbolizes all of that. Look at those. Those eyes penetrating, but that mouth looking, I don't think so. <laughs> you know? I don't really think so. And there's Jesus saying, is Jesus' hands upraised? Is that, do I see that right, Jeremiah? 
Yeah, hands up raised. There make no question about the fact like that I am here, as Jesus says. I am here. Now here's what I think is most amazing. This is, this is a week after that first appearance, right? You would think that Jesus felt like, I've done that. I've been there from my, I'm sorry that Thomas missed it, but other people can tell him about it, and the scriptures said they did. They told him a lot of times about it, but he still wouldn't believe. So, one of the great miracles of the resurrection, in my way of thinking, is that for this one guy, Jesus comes back again to the same room, to the same disciples, but this time plus one. So that that one might what? See him? Yeah. Believe the resurrection? Yeah. But believe that he, Jesus, is the Son of God. See, the key scripture in all this is that 31st verse that Peggy read. John says, I'm telling you all of this. Not so you have a lot of neat stories to tell your friends. Or you might have things to think about in five second groups. But I'm telling you all these things so that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and in so believing that you might have life in Him. Huh? Life in Him. That is a new identity. Jesus is consumed in His resurrection to know that people believe what has happened. That is, that he, as the Son of God, has come and dwell among us, and through his resurrection, continues to dwell among us. So he comes to Thomas, and he invites Thomas to overcome his suspicions, his doubt, his unbelief. One of the ways you can interpret what Jesus says is, Thomas, Come on, believe. <laughs> Stop unbelieving and start believing. And he even offers Thomas the opportunity to come and touch the wounds. Thomas, as far as we know, does not, but believes. How do we know he believes? Because what? What did he do? falls at Jesus' feet and says what? My Lord, my God. Not Lord God, but my Lord, my God. In that moment, Thomas accepts as the truth of his life, which is the only truth that matters, the truth of his life, that Jesus is the Son of God. Oh yeah, he believes in the resurrection because there's a risen Christ standing in front of him. But what's important is that he now knows that that Jesus is divine, that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the fountain of life, that Jesus is the light of life. And he takes that light into himself, and he bows before him, as everybody has to do if we're to recognize the reality and the truth of his life that's standing right there in front of us, my Lord, my God. And at that moment, takes on a new identity. He is no longer doubting Thomas, right? Nobody ever calls him that again. He is now St. Thomas. Yeah, he is St. Thomas. He is now believing Thomas. Believing Thomas, that's right, thank you. He is the believing Thomas, and believing Thomas, he becomes St. Thomas, he takes on. He's no longer that guy from Nazareth, or wherever he was from. He's no longer that fellow from Galilee. He's no longer the disciple that didn't show up the first time. He is no longer even the Jew who lives in Israel. He is now the believer in Jesus, and he takes on that new identity that sets him out into a new life. Jesus offers that for us all, right? Each of us has claimed Jesus and would be able to raise our hand and say, my Lord, my God. And then let that reality wash over us. No longer that person from Baltimore. No longer that person who just happens to have grown up in Gainesville or wherever. But now the one who has been 
breathed on by Jesus to have a new life and to live as he lived, to do as he did, to talk as he talked, and to move into the kingdom that he brought. Jesus says, as God sent me, so I send you. Is that interesting? I send you. Thomas, he says, I send you. You, you know the legend, and I don't know where all the history is on this, but I believe it's true, that Thomas found his way to India. It was a long walk. <laughs> it was a long walk. But he found his way to India, and there began preaching the resurrection that he saw here. And he told so many people about it that a church formed in India, which is called, even today, the Mar Thoma Church, the St. Thomas Church. As God sent me, says Jesus, so send I you. One of the greatest words I've heard in a long time, I heard this morning. I came in and I placed my boxes of cereal on the table because we'll continue to do that. And uh, one of the members of the church came up to me, who was here yesterday making breakfast, making sandwiches, and she said to me, when do we do it again? Because <laughs> that's always the thing. Jesus constantly doing what needed to be done. I often think about his schedule. When you get up in the morning, what do you think about? Well, I got this, I got this doctor's appointment, right? Uh, I'm gonna to need to do that, I'm gonna to need to do this, and I'm sure Jesus must have done the same. But as this thing shows, as this scene shows us, Jesus took his Scheduling directives from Thomas and the blind man that's on the corner. The crippled man that got lift, lifted down through the roof, right? The woman sitting at the well. They were his scheduled directives. And so we sent as Jesus was sent. Find a new identity in Christ. We are those who follow the resurrected Lord. Our God, our life, our light, we are those who just ask that God would direct us in the ways that we can show what the kingdom looks like to every person that we meet, to every breath we breathe, to every word we speak, to every deed we do. My Lord, my God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Praise us and good God. Thank you, Jesus. Who comes back for us again and again and again? Thank you, Lord, for His unrelenting presence. Just open our hearts. Open our eyes.